What's up, guys? We are back for another episode of TMP, the Menace Podcast. Very, very, very special guest today, and I can't wait to announce him. It is not, not only one, two, three, four, five, no, six-time Mr. Olympia, the shadow, Mr. Dorian Yates. Big D, what's up, what's, my man? What's up, Dennis, my mate? All right? I'm just, I, I, I just want to say this in the beginning. I, I'm so happy that you made the time to come on my podcast Oh, because, of course, man, we're all friends, so no problem, man. I, I, I know, I know. You're still looking uh, beefed up there, man. No, I'm, I'm downsized a lot, and this is my... Yeah. It, fe it feels like this is almost natural for me. You yeah. Know? I, I, I basically stay, stay the same. I go up, I diet all week. Saturdays, I cheat. My weight goes up on Sunday. Monday, I start dieting again. Friday, I'm back to where it was, so it's always the same. What, what's your body weight now? What are you holding so, like? Uh, 238 to 240. Okay, man, you look bigger than that. Yeah, right. because I got cool. no legs. That's why it's all upper body. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I sit behind the desk. Okay, I get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but here, here, I want to thank you for for making the time because uh, I, I know you're very busy, and uh, and very hard to uh, to get on a podcast because. Everybody wants Dorian, but Dorian does not talk to everybody, I guess. So, unless, and I'm not well, joking. you know, I'm, I'm much more communicative than I used to be in the past, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but I still, you know, deep down in the heart, I'm still quite a private person. So, I don't like to be in the limelight all the time. But, I mean, you know, we're and all this never, and Yeah, this never changed. Because this is what you come across. And I'm the people that don't know you, they only hear it from others. But I know you. And you're absolutely a person that do not... You don't, you don't like limelight. You don't. You don't. You're not an arrogant oh, I, person. I got used to it. I got used to it over the time and got more comfortable with it. But it's not the reason that I did bodybuilding. Maybe for some people it is. They want to get the, you know, the adulation. They want to be in the limelight, and that's cool. Um, but that was never the case for me. When I competed, I was just wanted to train, and that was what I enjoyed doing, and keep myself to myself. And then the contest was like something like a kind of a benchmark, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, then, then you have to, you know, obviously expose uh, yourself and everything like that comes with it. But uh, it's not, um, my personality is naturally not to really seek the limelight, although it's kind of a contradiction in bodybuilding, I guess, because, you know, you get up on stage in front of thousands of people. Well, if you look at other people, yeah, because the difference with you, whether you are, this is what I realized, you're just so laid back, you know. Even when you talk, you sound like you just, you don't get involved in drama. You never got involved in drama. I never heard you talking about others in a way where you want to create some stupid drama. You always were so, oh, just so laid back and stayed out of it. Energy. This just takes your energy away. I left the drama to other people. And uh, it's funny now, you know, you, you like after the competitive era is over, we're all relaxed and we all can have a talk and everything like that. There was always some kind of needle or some kind of little bit of animosity between me and Sean Ray. Yeah. And we were like opposite ends of the <laughs> spectrum. And, uh, and I, you know, we met up a few years ago, I think it was in Dubai and we we're doing a seminar together. And, and he said, look, I realized every time I was talking shit about you, I was just giving you more fuel. I'm like, yes, thank you very much for that. I wouldn't <laughs> say anything, but I would, I would take that. Yeah. <laughs> take you to the gym with me. So you, you just helping me out, man. Really right. wasn't helping yourself. So, so we don't really need to talk about your achievements because everybody knows what Dorian achieved. But what I wanted to know is, when you started, you, you didn't do a lot of shows. So I think your pro shows, before you got to the Olympia, was one or two Night of Champions? I did. The, my, my total contests were, um, well, my first contest was just like, they had an inter-gym contest in Birmingham where I come from in England. And I went into that contest and won it with no preparation, no diet or anything like that. I've been training for about, I think I've been training seriously for like eight months. And, to the first and I, show. I that. Yeah, it was just like a first time or, or something like that. And I won that. And then I went, the next year I went to EFBB and but, I went to compete. Which, in which, is, which is the British IFBB. Correct? IFBB, English Federation mm -hmm. it was called then. Now it's called something else. Um, but I went there to compete in an intermediate contest, regional. And, you know, my goal was like, I'd like to win this contest. And then I want to go to the intermediate finals and try to be intermediate, like British champion. That was my goal uh, for the year. And again, you know, 
around about 18 months training now. And um, I didn't see what other people saw at that point. Now I look at the pictures and I'm laughing. I'm like, yeah, it's okay. It's obvious. But Yeah, but that's, that was uh, your personality. You just had no yeah. arrogance whatsoever. I went there and I remember being backstage and thinking, you oh, know, that guy looks pretty good, that guy. Yeah. But, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe I can win this, maybe. I went on stage, I did my poses, I came off, and I was, like, crowded backstage by all the judges and the officials, and they're like, <laughs> where the hell have you come from? What are you doing here in this yeah. contest? I'm like, what do you mean? My, you know, I'm a novice, my first time. No, 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 you should be in the heavyweights. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, technically I'm a heavyweight, but I don't think I'm good enough for that. And they're, they're, like, laughing at me, you know? They're like, this guy, it's not good enough, <laughs> yeah? Okay, let me tell you, kid. You're the best heavyweight we got in this whole damn country right now. How, how, old, were you, how old were you that time? 23 years old. 23. I, I couldn't take it in. And then I was like, they like, we want you to compete on the British team in the World Games next weekend or two, or two weeks after. I can't remember if it was one or two weeks after this contest uh, in the heavyweight division for, the, for England. Uh, and reluctantly, a little bit, I went. Um, and I got seventh place in what's technically a world championship. And um, the winner was Barry DeMay. Second place was Matt Mendenhall, who was another phenomenal bodybuilder. Uh, and I got seventh place there uh, out of um, 14 guys. And I just came from a novice contest, the, you right. know, the week before. So that was that. Then I did two British championships. One, I won the heavyweight class, but I didn't win the overall. And at that time, you know, they weren't giving out pro cards like now, like you get them on a box of cornflakes or something. <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, right? you now know, you the, just almost just got to show up. Uh, that, now you, then you have to be like one guy in the country. Right. You have four weight classes, then you had one overall winner, and this guy got the pro card. So they, they were hard to get then. But was it still, uh, so did you get your pro card through the British Championships? I did, but not the first time. It was a bit controversial. I won the heavyweights, and they gave the overall to light heavyweight guy. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the first time when I was like, well, that's, you know, maybe there's a bit of politics here or something. I don't talk to anybody. I don't know anybody. Right. You know, all that stuff. Um, but, you know, like, often in life, some things are a blessing in disguise. Uh, it was probably good. I had to wait. To you know, I got better and I competed again. I won the whole thing in '88, uh, and then my first pro show was Night of Champions in 1990. So I done like three shows before I turned pro, two, two, and then I did Night of Champions. Got second to Ben Asisa, mm -hmm. uh, and then the next year I won the contest. I think Sonny Smith was second, and then went to compete in the Olympia uh, with and got, Lee Haney. So and, and got very second. little contest experience, really. Yeah. So, turning pro, I mean, back then, and even though winning the British, I think at that time it was still the, uh, whoever was the British president had to still had to send a letter to the IFBB yeah. to uh, ask for your pro card. It was not like that you automatically get it because you won the British championship. So, they, I think uh, they still I, had I'm to not petition. Sure, but, uh, the... The head of the English Federation of Bodybuilding then was a guy called Ron Davis. And Ron was an international judge. He used to judge at the Mr. Olympia and mm -hmm. everything. And he was one of the guys that there was backstage telling me, like, man, you, you, you're better than all the heavyweights we got. And he actually had a gym in Birmingham. And so he kind of mentored me a little bit for the first couple of years, really to try to build my confidence. Because he was like... You know, you don't realize how good you are. Like, like this guy in the Olympia that I'm reading about. I'm reading about these guys in the magazines. You right, know? right. I know. Uh, I, I, I've been there. I, I'm going to let you talk. You know, and I, I'm looking up to these guys. And he's like, no, no, you're better than this guy. You can beat him. I'm like, oh, come on, man. Be serious. He's like, I'm telling you, I've been there. I've seen the guy. And I'm, you know, uh, I've seen him in the flesh and everything. So he was, uh, you know, Ron did a good job in kind of... Uh, uh, giving me confidence because this guy was a was a judge from Olympia, so he should know, right? right. It's not you know, so he some local gym owner or something. So he gave you that he, motivation. He, who inspired you yeah, at that time? Who who did you look up to as a bodybuilder? Uh, I looked up to the guys that were like 
like Mensa. Okay. Because I like Mensa because of his training and his uh, all the articles in the magazines and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there was like some intelligence and some logic behind it, and that appealed to me somehow to the way I thought. I'm kind of a logic, strategic thinker. Um, so my mentor, uh, I really admired uh, the guys that lifted. They look strong, you know. They lifted right. heavy weights as well. So it was a guy called Casey Viator. Absolutely, uh, yes. You know, I mean, the guy was thick and he had the forearms and he was super strong like a bull. Uh, a guy came to Birmingham and did a seminar by the name of Tim Balknap. Tim, know if you remember him. Tim Balknap, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, he was like short but Herculean, like thick. <laughs> Uh, powerful muscle and that's kind of what I aspired to although if you look at my early physique is um, doesn't really look like that it was it was all the heavy training I did over the years my early physique was what you would class maybe looks more like classic or aesthetic mm-hmm. when in the earlier shots um, but that's what I wanted to create I wanted to create this powerful uh, boundary push in physique and that's always what I kind of had in mind and, and and went for so those are the guys that that I admired and I looked up to um, guys that were big but they also could move the weights in the gym I kind of like that right so okay so now you're pro you go to New York for the first the first year in 1990 play second I mean yeah. I, I, I can't even imagine how that felt coming from coming from England play Man, that sec- was, a, was a crazy experience yeah. and uh, You know, you, you grow up in England in, in the 70s and uh, and so on. Like watching, I don't know, Kojak. Right. American cop shows and yeah. stuff like that. So New York was this like fantasy place that was like on the TV. And and then I'm there and I'm, I remember walking around the streets of New York in Manhattan and just like looking up at the skyscrapers and just thinking, wow, this is surreal. Yeah. Am yeah. I here? Is this real? It's like... <laughs> It was it was a crazy experience. Uh... People always ask how I got here. I was willing to work just a little harder than everyone else every damn day. If I can have hundreds of hours back, you know I'm gonna grab them. Spending hours prepping chicken, rice, and vegetables. F that. I rely on perfect nutrition. I rely on trifecta. <laughs> it, it was it was a crazy experience. Uh, and um, because nobody knew me, um, and I was coming from England, which doesn't have really a pedigree of producing like the top guys, um, nobody paid me no mind, really. I mean, Wayne DeMille picked me up at the airport uh, because the the guy from the English Federation got in touch with him and say, look, you know, this guy's coming and he doesn't know anybody, he doesn't know where to go. And Wayne's like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll sort something out. I'll sort a gym for him and some accommodation. Uh, but now I can guess what happened. It was a gym called Natural Physique. And, um, you know, Wayne asked the guy at the gym if he can find somewhere for me to stay and can I train at the gym. So one guy must have volunteered in, in, the, in the gym to put me up. And we met him at like two o'clock in the morning, lower east side of New York. The, and Wayne dropped us off at this apartment block. Next door was all taped up with police tape. It was a crack house or something. <laughs> and uh, I went to the guy's apartment and, you know, it was like a little room for me and my wife. And there's homoerotic art all over the, the, the walls and stuff like this. And it was just weird. And my wife was like, I'm not staying here. I'm not staying here. <laughs> oh, okay, man. So, you, so, uh, so you stayed with someone you had no idea who it was? I didn't. I said, I said, sorry, listen, thank you for the offer and everything. But, uh, you know, I, you haven't got, you know, I just made some polite excuses. Like, you haven't got the facilities I need and everything. I need to get a hotel with um, cooking facilities and everything. Right. And he's like, yeah, okay, I'll get that in the morning. I'm like, no, man, like, you don't understand. I need that. <laughs> like now. I need to leave now. <laughs> So we ended up staying in the Chelsea Hotel in New York, which was where I already knew this because I was a punk rock fan, right? Um, Sid Vicious murdered his girlfriend in this hotel. And then (laughs) from being a a punk rock fan to then ending up in the same hotel as Sid Vicious. That's crazy. The whole whole experience was surreal. And 
as I said, I, you know, I felt kind of left out and nobody was paying no attention until I went to work out at the gym and still nobody was giving me any attention, any respect, like, oh, okay, go on. Because they didn't know who you were. They didn't know. And then after the workout, I was downstairs uh, with my ex-wife, Debbie, and I started to practice some posing in the mirrors because I had some downstairs. I didn't know they had a little TV camera there. Oh, they watched you. That was, that was feeding to upstairs to the, you know, the gym reception. So then they saw that everyone's came down and then just, it just changed. Like as soon as they saw me, everyone was freaking out. Cause I was like super shredded at that point, even like to the point of being, you know, over dieted and everything, but I was super cut and, uh, they were freaking out. They hadn't seen anything like that. So, um, everything changed from that, that point on. And of course, in the end, I got second in a contest to Momo, who was, uh, also an incredible bodybuilder. Yes, and to 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 mention that, because back then the United Champions wasn't like 15, 20 guys. They were up 50, 55. There was unbelievable it amount was, of competitors. It was a big show because it was the Night of Champions and the Arnold were the two contests where the top five would qualify for Mr. Olympia. Right. All the other shows were top three. Right. So the Arnold obviously was number two to the Olympia because it had the prize money. Night of Champions didn't have the prize money, but it had the prestige. Uh, and the top five went to the Olympia, and Wayne was the promoter and all that stuff. So it also had a history there. Of, right. Of Gaspari won the Night of Champions. Robbie Robinson won the Night of Champions. So there are big names that, that went from that contest to, to be very successful. So you play second, qualify for the for your first Olympia and your first, first try. Yeah. Now you're going up against... Uh, Lee Haney, who's going for his eighth title. So I would have been, no, no, uh, that, that was 90 that I got the Night of Champions. So uh, I still felt I got second. Oh, yeah, that, that was 90. So you didn't do the Olympia. So you waited another no, year. I, I, Joe Weider flew me out to California and I did the shoot for Flex and everything, which is, you know, younger guys that are listening now, they got the internet. Back then, it was all about the magazines. Right. And you weren't anybody and you didn't have anything until you got yourself in those right. uh, Weeder magazines, the Flex, the Muscle and Fitness or Muscle Build or whatever it was at the time. Muscle and Fitness, um, yeah. So when Joe Weeder flies you out to California and you do a photo shoot, then you know you're on your way. And I got my first uh, Flex cover. So it was interesting that I, even though I got second in the contest, I was the one that got thrown out to California because Weeder saw something in me that they was saw. a bit different, maybe maybe more marketable or something, I don't know, but it was, uh, and, and I got the first flex cover rowing a 200 pound dumbbell because I didn't want to do, photographers always hated me because I was very awkward to work with because I just want to do my own thing. Yeah. I didn't want to do what they wanted to do. Um, but fortunately, Chris Lund, he was a British guy. Right. Remember Chris? Chris Lund and Peter well, McGough. You know, we, yeah. we, we, could, uh, we could communicate and I'm like, Chris, I don't want to do this bullshit. I'm not wearing sunglasses in the gym, man. And sp spray me with some, they used to spray you with this. Spritz you, so they spritz you, yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and, he, and he's going to smile and all this cheesy <laughs> stuff. I'm like, I just can't do that, man. Why can't I lift this weight? And he's like, can you lift that weight? So like, are you? Yeah, I can, so I are can you, lift it, but I can't hold it and smile. I'll just get it up. You're going to yeah. get the picture. So you might be the reason why Chris Lunt was known for making people getting the magic shot by using real weight and real trainings and not do that, that bullshit. Was absolutely the reason. Because after that shot, and it, you know, if you're lifting a 200 pound dumbbell or you're lifting a fake weight, they even used fake weights back in the day. So, you know, if you're lifting a 200 pound dumbbell, I mean, the, the fans on your neck are yes. popping out, your eyeballs are popping out. You can't fake that, yeah? Right. So it was a look that captured people because they could see the energy. Uh, and that's uh, what I wanted to get across. This is not about wearing sunglasses and posing and smiling. That's all good, but it's about some bloody hard work. So you're not only... Day, you know, you've got to do some work. So that, I guess that was, that picture was popular. And then Chris, it's funny because Chris, then he wanted everybody to work out heavy. Yeah. Even like just after a contest when they were not, yes. when they were you know, kind of yeah. dehydrated and everything. So it got to the point where, in the end, I was saying, Chris, I'm not doing, you know, I'll, I'll do this, but I'm not doing that because it's too dangerous. Right. You're trying to push the envelope too much. And in the end, we got, um, 
you know, John Pierre Fuchs that yes, that was for his quads. I know exactly that shoot. that happened one week after me. That actually, I think I was the reason for that. For that, because I did the week or two week prior, I did the photo, the same photo shoot, and squatted seven plates, and I went down. I came back. That was. I did it a couple of weeks before, two weeks before the Arnold, 2001. Oh. And then uh, Chris laying on the floor, I'm going down, I stand back up. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to push the button. Can you do another rep? <laughs> I swear to God, I went down again, did it. He got the picture, it, it, it made flex. And yeah. a week or two weeks later, he had Sean Pierre Fuchs in there doing the leg yeah. workout. And he was doing the same thing, he was doing the free weights. And I don't know, somehow probably motivated him saying what I did. He tried to do the same yeah. tour both quads. I remember that. Yeah, but you know how it is, like uh, near to a contest and shortly after the contest, you're probably dehydrated. Your body fat's very low. I know. It was, you, it was you know, crazy. You, you're, yeah. you're in a vulnerable state. I mean, both of my injuries, bicep tear and a tricep tear, I did in the last, uh, the, the, the tricep tear tendon was like three weeks before the contest. The bicep tear was six weeks before. Um, so I, if I advise people now, I coach people, I, I kind of have them cruise in and cut back a little bit on the weights the mm -hmm. last six to eight weeks. I mean, you're not going to build anything anyway because you're not taking enough calories. You just should be maintaining. But that, I that, this you know, gung-ho, yeah. would have been all the time attitude. Right. That would have been another question for me. Like, if you could do it all over again, what would you change? Well, it's a question I get asked a lot. And um, the obvious answer would be that, you know, I would advise myself and to back off a little I would bit. get injured. But, you know, everything has a reason, man. Even the things that you don't like at the time and might seem to be a negative. Maybe 97 was the time for me to do my last contest and the, the injury just kind of forced that point. Mm -hmm. I do remember starting my prep for the Olympia in 97. And somehow I didn't have the enthusiasm that I had previously. It was starting to become like a job. Mm -hmm. And I was starting to think, what am I going to do after this? Because something inside me was telling me like, this is not, you need to change direction or maybe there's something else in life you need to do or, or something like that. I was starting to feel it in 97. So, Regardless of the injury, um, I don't know how much longer I would have gone because I was never like motivated to try to get equal or beat Lee Haney's record. It was never like in my vision. I was just taking one year at a time. And <clears throat> the, the passion for me was the training and to see if I could improve. And once you start getting injuries, you know it's, it becomes more difficult to improve. You get one injury, it it's like throws off the balance of the whole yeah, and, and body you, and, and you're I, liable to get another one somewhere else later on because you're throwing stress along the chain. If you get one le win weak link in the chain, then the stress goes somewhere else. Yeah, and, 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 and you're kind of depressed or demotivated because you can't train the way you would like to train. And, and of course, that affects, uh, it affects the whole look on top of it. So I, I, I can understand that. I never had an injury while I was active, but I had one after you know, and, and yeah. realized when I had my shoulder surgery and my biceps tendon, it was not completely detached, but it was hanging off a thread up here. Yeah. And when yeah. uh, he basically just took that part out and he connected it around, somewhere in my armpit. And he said to me, while I'm in there, I'm going to look at the shoulder. And then when I was in there, he was in there, he saw that I had a labrum tear. I had, I put two anchors yeah. in my rotator cuff or whatever that is. I don't even know. And since then, I realized that you don't train the same because you always have this in the back of your mind. I was like, you know, I mean, if it happens here, it could happen over there. So, yeah. so I can understand. So, you, you, you. If it wasn't for the injuries, so you were probably would you still retired in two th in ninety seven? I don't know because uh, I was just getting that feeling. So maybe I would have uh, done another year. I don't know, or maybe I would have like um, made a slow exit. Whereas the injury just finished things for me. I had yeah. the surgery and they repaired the tendon, but it was the same thing um, where it was not a clean tear. It was a big, you know, it was a big tear and uh, probably many, many years of little tears and a yes. little bit of scar tissue and stuff like that. And the tendon becomes very damaged. Um, and I did the, the surgery. I did all the rehab. I got back into training to see 
you know, how would it go? And this time was a much bigger effect than the bicep tear. The bicep tear was aesthetically uh, damaging, especially in a front double bicep. Mm-hmm. But it didn't really change my training that much. It didn't, it didn't, uh, bicep weights didn't go down. The back so, row, the so rowing you, didn't go down. So you weren't in pain? No, uh, it was just shortened. I was in pain for a while, but once it healed up, it was okay. I wasn't in pain. Um, <clears throat> but obviously, it did throw off because it was the same arm that later on I got the tricep injury with. Mm-hmm. And I, then later on, after I finished bodybuilding, uh, and my shoulder was probably in bad shape as well on that side, and then I, I tore it uh, doing some martial arts stuff I was doing. I tore it. So the mm-hmm. tendons were all in bad shape after so many years of heavy training. And um, also, interestingly, I was reading somewhere recently that, uh, of course, getting ready for a contest, a lot of us use anti-estrogens, and apparently they they can weaken the tendons as well. So mm-hmm. making you more vulnerable. And maybe that's why guys, the combination of factors why guys now tend to train a lot lighter. And we're not seeing so many people get injured now, I don't think. Right. What does it feel like knowing, I mean, if you look back at your career, I mean, 92, you, uh, no, 91, you did your first Olympian and it was 91, correct? 91, I got, I got second. You got with, second to, yeah. to Lee Haney. So now going yeah. into 92, because I remember we had a conversation a long time ago, because I asked you, I said, what did you do from 92 to 93? Because you not only yeah. changed the game when it comes to photo shoots, you changed the game in bodybuilding. You can look back. Dorian Yates changed the game completely. From 92 to 93, people still to this day talk about your your yeah. improvement. And I remember you telling me, I didn't improve. He said, I just didn't lose the unnecessary weight that I was lo- losing the year before. Something similar to that. Do you remember? Yeah, because what I used to do, I mean, we didn't have digital cameras or anything then. Uh, you know, you take a shot with the camera and then you got to go take it to the the pharmacy to get developed and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So I used to have these throwaway cameras and go take it. And so every week leading up to the contest, I used to take some pictures at home in the same kind of light, the same place and everything like that. Um, and 92, I was aware that I was probably losing some size because I wanted to get shredded mm-hmm. as I knew Haney wasn't competing and Kevin LeBron was not really on the radar at that point in my mind. So I'm thinking, who's my competition? Is Logically, it's um, Vince Taylor because he got third and to my second. Uh, Sean Ray, Labrada, all these guys are much smaller than me. So I can afford to maybe lose some size to come in shredded. So I beat them in size and I beat them in condition as well. Right. <clears throat> so I was aware that I was losing a bit, but I don't think I was aware of how much. So... I went back and I looked and I'm like, here, look at this picture. Six weeks out. I got shredded glutes. <laughs> I look in contest shape. So six weeks, I'm losing weight, I'm losing weight, I'm losing weight. Okay, I got a little bit more separated, a little harder, but I got flatter, I got smaller. So I try to avoid doing that next time, although I still had a tendency to do it a little bit, overdo things, because that's just... You still were ready cool. six weeks out, because I remember those pictures, yeah, I, you're I, just I, standing there with your socks on. Yeah, the black and white pictures are are there. I was like 270 and a bit, 270-something like that. And I came in at 256, 257. So, yeah, I still probably sacrificed a bit, but there was a huge difference between 92 and 93. I think it was 17 pounds. I mean, for a Mr. Olympia to put 17 pounds of pure muscle on stage, I don't know what Ronnie did between 97 and 90. 98, but probably not that much. So I think it was unique. And of course, the black and white pictures comparing 92 and 93 were, you know, iconic in Flex magazine. Oh, yes. Although they were a little bit misleading because the 92 pictures were taken a week after the contest in 92. So, you know, I'd lost that size. It was a little bit flat and everything. Where the black and whites from 93 were taken six weeks before. Mm. If you took the six weeks before pitches from 92 and compared to them to six weeks before 93, there would be a difference, but it wouldn't be so huge. Oh, okay. I, I, I say I probably put on a good six or seven pounds of muscle between the two contests. Oh. The other 10 pounds were just stuff with, that I sacrificed. Right, I right. 
So now you're not only known for being the biggest guy in your area, you are always, always the hardest, the grainiest. How did you yeah. manage to do that? Did you, did you ever work with someone or did you just do it all by yourself? I did it all by myself. I mean, this concept of having a coach or working with somebody mm -hmm. was totally foreign to me. I mean, the reason I like bodybuilding is because it was all me. Right. Like all my life, I felt like, you know, for whatever reason, like family and this and that and system, I felt everyone's letting me down. I, I, I need to take care of myself, yeah? Um, so I was not really a team player. I was very individual. Um, so I studied the nutrition. I read every magazine, every book that's published probably between 1983 and 97. I had a huge collection at one point and then they were in the basement and we had a flood and it all got destroyed. So that was a shame. I had every magazine, every little Iron Man, Flex, Muscle Fitness, like even old magazines that people used to give me I had a huge collection. So I studied everything. And then, you know, contest prep and um, anabolics and all that stuff. <coughs> we had very little, you know, as you know, back then, we had the Dan Duchesne's underground book and a few couple of magazine articles and uh, word of mouth type of thing. So I worked everything out for myself and I kept notes and a very analytical and strategic. If I tried something, I would make a small change and then I would see what effect that had. Or if I changed my training or diet, the same thing, and I'd make notes. Then I'd look back on last year and last week and last month. I got all this information, like almost like an experiment to see what works and what doesn't work. So um, I kind of got it down. But what was unique that I did to get that look? Uh, first of all, it'll be every look that you have is somewhat genetic, you know, like some people have crosturations in their thighs. I don't matter if I diet down until there's nothing left. I want to get, it's just not there. You know, it's not my I structure. Remember, I remember you telling me that, you know, I remember you said um, I could diet down too. You know, I tried it and it's it just the muscle shape and the muscle structure that's genetic. That uh, lean look, I, I got a daughter that's 20. My son is like 35, 36 now. They both don't have it like any body fat. You know, they're, they're very lean naturally. Oh. And then I think the fact that I trained uh, heavy, like all the time, and when I'm saying heavy, it makes a relative thing, right? Heavy for you might not be heavy for me or vice versa, but I was doing like the basic exercises, five and six reps. Yeah, I remember that. I, uh, I followed you. I was doing you. like 10 and 12s, like most people. I was doing fives and sixes. So, so, you, I think, so you basically yeah. trained exactly the way when you put that video out. That blood and guts, that yeah, was that, that, that was, was your it. workout. The, 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 the idea with the video was <clears throat> I watched videos before. I watched all everything, man. I never saw anybody like really training. You had these, you know, the road to the Olympia videos and stuff like that, where you see the guys in the gym before a contest and they're just kind of pumping and everything. Mm -hmm. I was never inspired. And uh, then you you know, you couldn't just go and get a video camera and film. It was not something video cameras were not out like you had to get a, a film company to come with the big cameras and everything yeah, yeah. and uh, I realized what was happening that the the film companies are producing this material and they want to do it from their perspective so they want to have good angles they want to have good lighting um, which is obviously going to interfere with you having a real workout so I got a little puppy here who's making noise that's okay that's okay um so I said to Kevin Horton, I don't know if you remember Kevin, yes. British photographer. Oh, yes. I'm like, Kevin, can you can you hire a camera and come to the gym and film me training? But I literally don't want to know you're there. I'm not going to talk to you. You're not going to talk to me. I, I don't give a shit about the lights. I want you to capture <laughs> Raw workouts. what I'm doing. And uh, the, the energy and the, the weights and, and the re you know what I'm really doing here. Um, so that's what we did. And uh, people said to me, why did you film it in black and white? Well, we didn't film it in black and white. We filmed it in color. But we were watching the replays afterwards. And I thought, I don't know, man. It's too bright. There's something, there's too much colors in this thing. So you changed it. I, I just had a brain thing. I was like, remember this film um, with De Niro in Raging Bull? Uh, it's, I remember uh, it's that. about Jake Lamotta. He's, he's a boxer. 
Yes, yes, they yes, yes. And, and they filmed it all in black and white. Yes. You see the blood spurting out and all this in the fight scenes. And, and it just looks like somehow realistic and gritty and uh, it, it reflected my background. Like, you know, I'm in this basement gym. It's in a, I'm in an industrial city in England. It's not, I don't have beaches. I don't have sun. Um, so I said to Ke Kevin, listen, man, can you turn the collar off, make it black and white? He's like, sure, let's do that. I'm like, bam. That's it. That's it. That's what we're going with. And that, you know, that was the, the tape that we ended up with. And that's why it was, people wanted to, you know, so many people say to me, like, I wore that tape out or I wore that disc out because I used to watch it before I went to the gym. I to watched your tape so many times. If I tell you, I couldn't even, I can't even remember how many times I watched you on specific body parts before yeah. every time I, before I was on my way to the gym, I choose certain guys' body parts to get motivated. When I was living in Thailand, there was no, I had nobody around me. So I had, yeah. to, I had to use, back it was still VHS, there was no disc. It was VHS. Yeah, it was a tape to start with. And yeah. your tape was, I mean, all day, every day. And I remember I had people around me and they trained in my gym. They will copy the way you groan and the way the sounds that you make. People will just, <laughs> I was like, you watched Dorian's tape, didn't you? He said, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, so, copy my training partner with his, with his phrases. You know? I think even, oh. my, even when I did a, my first video I did, this is the way I do it. The guy that I used from New Zealand to, you know, to motivate me a little bit, I think he was motivated by your video. He started screaming at me. I didn't realize all this until yeah. I saw the video <laughs> later because it was ridiculous, you know? <laughs> but no, your video, th that video still to this day, I think is one of the most motivating and most inspiring uh, uh, training videos out there because it's literally raw. There's no, yeah, you it's, could, it's real, it's raw. And then, yeah. you know, afterwards, as I said, we were watching it and I'm like, shall I do some voiceover? Shall I do some instruction? Shall I, and in the end, I'm like, listen, man, it, it speaks for itself. I don't need to say anything. I don't need to say, you know, lower the weight slowly and, and use good form and all that shit yeah. because you can see it. It's there, man. It's Just there. It's look at it. everything included, but you spitting on the ground, everything included. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's my gym, man. I can do what I want. So. Yeah, and, and for the people, for the people, the gym owners that had people spitting on the floor because of me. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people that spit on the floors because of you. That's true. So yeah. for, for me, I mean, I've been to, I've been to Temple Gym. I mean, it's absolutely this I mean, everything that you need, but it's as basic as it could get. So and 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 for me, it, it's the inspiring part of you. Is you never you never went away from your plan. You stayed there. You didn't move yeah. to the stage like like many others would have done. You stayed in your little temple gym, and I was in there. It was a, it yeah. was a temple gym, and yeah. you just came back to the U.S. before the Olympia just to represent. I want to know. I mean, the consistency and condition, and and you know, compared to the guys, the bigger guys. Let's let's say in the past fifteen years. Everybody over 250, 260. I have not seen anyone with your condition. Why, why would you say, what, what do you think is the reason for these guys after, behind you? Let's not talk about Ronnie. Let's talk about the guys yeah. other than Ronnie. Why do you think, what's the reason for these guys not to bring in the size now, but then I'm bringing the condition into detail? Why do you think that is? I don't know the actual specific reasons because I haven't really had a conversation with them. The only guy that I had a conversation with about current conditioning levels was Flex Lewis mm -hmm. uh, because he's British and, you know, we got to see each other a bit more probably and uh, I spoke with him and he is coming in shape. So right. I said, Flex, what's up, man? What's up with the people? You know, why, why, why is the general standard seem to have declined? And uh, he said, yeah, just lazy bastards. <laughs> that was his uh, response. But it's like... Every era has a standard. So when I became Mr. Olympia, I set the bar yeah. here, yeah. right? Not just for size, but for conditioning as well. So the other guys saw that and they're like, man, i got to kick my ass because i got to try to get there or somewhere near that. That's, that's the standard, right? There seems to be a, have been a decline in the accepted standard where now guys are coming in. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, man. I'm just saying that's the way it is. Yeah. Guys are coming in now being more concerned about being fuller and rounder and not so much with the condition, whereas before we were like more on the condition. And if I get a little bit flat, 
and I lose a bit of fire, screw it, but I got to be shredded. Man. Right, right. So there was a different mentality, I think, and a different accepted standard of how uh, the conditioning would be. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether guys were better then or better now and all that stuff. I don't want to get into it. It's just a different... The, the accepted standard was different by the competitors and maybe by the judges I used to looking at and so on. I was just about to say, do you think the judges have a little bit of a... a, a, um, a, a, a it's, it's a reason that the judges maybe are warden less than stellar well, you, condition? You know, if you've got the guys that are all kind of at a certain level of conditioning that's fairly equal. I'm not saying everybody, but some guys are coming in like... Um, Adi from Iran. Yes, Adi. He comes, yes. In pretty, he comes in pretty sharp, pretty hard. Yes. Um, but generally, uh, the condition has gone down. So maybe the, the judges, I'm not saying the judges made this happen or they dictated it or mm -hmm. whatever, but it's just what they get used to. And it's evolved to that over time. And um, I think guys are now a bit more concerned, as I say, with being round and full, and they don't want to sacrifice that for the conditioning. So it is... Uh, is a different accepted standard now. So when I look at it, in my eyes, I'm thinking the guys are not really in shape yet. They're on stage, but there's, for me, they look like they're not finished products. Yeah, Although they're true. bigger and fuller. It's true, it's true. You, you just see it, it's, back then, you could say the top 10 were all in shape. Yeah. All of them. And, and, it's little, it's, and, and in the last, I don't even know how many years, in the last, let's take 10, 15 years, you can see there's one or two, maybe three guys that are in shape, and then the rest is just not not in that yeah. condition. That, that and, and how did I do it? It's like, it's like a fucking obsession, man. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to be really extremely good at anything, you have to be a little bit loco, a little bit obsessed. But how so are, I was obsessed with being in this condition and, and being shredded. I wanted to be like, I want to be like, huge but i want to combine that with the condition of like a lightweight or a middleweight at the time and um that it's just the only thing that was in my mind getting ready for a contest like gotta get shredded gotta get shredded how, sometimes i overdid a little bit maybe how early would you start your contest diet um average 12 weeks average 12, 12 weeks, weeks. so you basically got in shape in less than eight weeks because you six weeks out you already yeah almost. i mean as soon as i changed my diet and i dropped the carbs down um, and changed my protocol, let's say, which is another thing that was unique. I only used anabolic kind of uh, stuff going ready, getting ready for a contest all the way through. So I drop a lot of water the first three weeks. I might lose um, in the first three weeks. I might lose like 15 pounds in the first three weeks. Mm -hmm. And then it would settle down to being around two or three pounds a week. So, <clears throat> yeah, probably... I could get into what's accepted contest shape now in probably six or seven weeks from where my off season was. Joe Weider's Olympia here in Orlando, Florida. A little bit strange coming out of Las Vegas for all of those years. Good evening and welcome to the event that nearly never happened. There's been an absence of a particular group of people on this stage that are back tonight. Tonight I'm here to say, welcome back to Miss Olympia. I could get into what's accepted contest shape now in probably six or seven weeks from where my off season was. So, so you do help others, you know, in the contest prep, I see. Yeah, I, I, I do, but you know what? I really like to train people in the gym. That's uh, So you more like you training? Know, I, I don't want to be a Olympia prep guru. Yeah. There's enough of those guys out there already. And it's not something I want to spend all my time doing. But what I really enjoy is one-on-one -on -one with somebody in the gym, explaining to them exactly how to do this exercise uh, 
and getting inside their head and mentally um, helping them to realize what they can do and realize what their potential is. I mean, it's a passion of mine, man. I love training. Right. I, I can't really train heavy now because I've got injuries, but it doesn't matter. If it's physical, if you put me on a bike or or anything, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna push and I'm gonna love like seeing yeah. where I can where I can go with it. So the the, the training in the gym is um, is my favorite thing, and I got an online uh, coaching platform as well, DY Academy, mm -hmm. where I'm helping people with the diet, the training, and so on. But majority of them are not contest bodybuilders; they're just oh, okay. people who want to shape. So, but when you train somebody, do you, do you train them like? The way you trained back in the days, so or you kind of adjusted that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, the way the way that I train, but it's going to adapt to the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, guy, I really enjoyed training last year, training and coaching actually for the Olympia uh, was uh, uh, Gabriele Andrulli, I think his second name is. He's from Italy. He got second place in the wheelchair category. Okay. So I mean that was interesting, right? Because the guy has no use of his legs, so we had to adapt things. We had, you know, even like. You know, imagine doing a bench press, but you can't use your legs to stabilize. So we had to be inventive and uh, had the guy to help me as well to kind of stabilize him on different machines and stuff. So I had to adapt for him. Um, so if somebody's really passionate like that uh, and I can train them as well as doing the diet and all the other stuff mm -hmm. they need advice with, um, then I enjoy that. But working with somebody remotely, uh, getting ready for a contest is... Uh, It's difficult, and it, I get kind of frustrated if I feel people are not giving a hundred percent. Right, that's the problem because you are you were like a machine, and some people yeah, they, they're just I, not I like expect, that. I expect everyone to like give their best, and if they're not doing that, then I, I feel like I don't have interest in it. You yeah, know? it's difficult. What, what's Dorian doing right now? I think you moved to Spain years ago. You yeah, do, I've been in Spain now for six or seven years. How's that and going a lot for of people, you? Of course, they ask me why. Why is Spain? Well, I live in Marbella, which is on the south coast of Spain, just across from Morocco and Gibraltar. And there's a huge British community here. I started coming here on vacation and I met a lot of people here. There's good gyms here. It's good food, great weather. We've got beaches, we've got mountains. Like anything you've got in L.A., we've got here. But it's a small, you know, it's not a big town. Don't have traffic and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so <clears throat> I'm just kind of practicing my Spanish now. I mean, my wife, Gal, she can speak Spanish and oh. Portuguese and, you know, she's from Brazil. So, but it's a kind of place where you don't need to speak Spanish. You know, you're not, like, everyone speaks British here, it speaks English. So, yeah, kind of not forced to do it. So I feel a bit lazy, like a typical British person not <laughs> learning. So I'm trying to learn so, now. So how good is your Spanish now? It's uh, muy malo. <laughs> <laughs> I just, no, no. you know what? I, I just thought about a real funny story, and I want to I, I want to mention this story. I don't know if you remember that it was years. I don't know what year it was. It was the, it was the time we were all in Vegas for the USA. I don't know how many years ago that is. I mean, yeah. it, it could had to be early 2000s, I think. Early 2000s, yeah, that was the. Uh Start of my party season. Exactly. You were already downsized. I remember you, you had yeah. a face. You had a face where you literally really downsized. I think you did it on yeah. purpose. You were downsized, but you came to the USA. So I remember. I don't know if you remember. This is a funny story. I, to, I told this story a thousand times. Yeah. We was, it was at the USA Saturday night. We ended up in the club. I don't remember what club it was. You remember we were standing on one side of the dance floor. And there was, you know, it was a lot of bodybuilders everywhere. And on the other side of the dance floor, there was a group of bodybuilders. And they okay. must have recognized you, okay? Because I, I don't know, they didn't know me. Because here's what happened. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> so all of a sudden, probably the weakest link of all of them that didn't know who, what is what, you know, they must have said something like, there's Dorian Yates over there. And you were standing next to me. We were standing together. Yeah. And I'm 300 pounds. So this dude, <laughs> this dude that came across the dance floor, He came right across the dance floor. He came to me. He shook my hand. He said, Dorian, it's so nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Man, Dorian got a good time this year. He's been in the sun a lot. <laughs> you don't remember that? And I was like, Dorian, he's standing right next uh, to me. It was, uh, it was probably in Dre's late at night. So, <laughs> yeah. I'll never forget that story, yeah, but, man. You know, if, if I'm like... 
if I'm like 240 and you're 300 pounds and he's like, oh, there's a Dorian Yates, Mr. Olympia, then... It's got to be the big dude. It's got to be the big dude. Yeah, and I'm like, I was laughing. I couldn't believe it. I was like, you fuck that Dorian. I said, Dorian's standing right here. It was so funny. It was so funny. Also, another thing is I still remember, and I'm still very proud to say that Dorian came to my wedding in Thailand. You were actually one of the guys. Yeah, man, I'll never yeah. forget that. That was yeah. an experience, man. You were actually one of the guys that flew all the way from England to Thailand just to be a part of my wedding. And also, I think you missed your first flight and you had to buy a new ticket. You remember that? Yeah, there was some drama going on at home and something happened. And uh, but I got there and uh, Dexter was there. Dexter, Milos. Milos and um, Stan McCrary. Um, uh, Stan Curly Top. Curly, Curly Top. Curly Top. Yeah. You know something, Dexter? Now you got all this prize money and everything under your belt. You still owe me a hundred dollars. I remember we were in the car yeah, where you kind of because there was no internet. Yeah. I know. So me and Dexter were having not an argument but a debate about the country with the biggest population in the world. Right. And I'm like, it's, it's easily China. And he's like, no, 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 it's India. I said, no, it's China, man. In the end, we went to a bookstore. Bought a Guinness Book of World Records. To settle this dispute, yeah? <laughs> and we bet $100 on it. And China has the biggest population than India. And I still don't have that $100 deck to the soul. <laughs> I remember, and I'm going to calculate the interest as well. Oh, on that. it's been it's been years, 19 right? years, yes, 19 years 19 of interest. Years. So that's yeah. that's 1,900 dollars, Dex. You owe to the yeah. you owe to the yeah. shadow. I remember, yeah. And as soon as he, you know, as soon as we proved that it was China, because I remember I said it's China. Yeah. And then yeah, yeah, then well, he wanted to pull out. He's very, he's very confident about India, though. So he put up the hundred dollars, and we went into a bookstore. No internet, so we went to the bookstore and we settled it. But uh, you know. I'll see you, Dexter, yeah. one time or another. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever have, have you ever been back to Thailand? I have. You know, I was there uh, just before the lockdown bullshit that started over. Oh, here. really? I was there for the whole of January in Koh Samui. Oh, okay, Koh Samui. Yeah, that's south. Yeah. yeah, me and Gal were there the whole month in Koh Samui, hanging out on the beach and doing some yoga and just kind of like chilling out. Really, which is normally when I go on vacation, I want to see everything. But there, it was there for a month, so it was a nice, uh, relaxed holiday. You know, just like massage every morning, a Thai massage every morning. It costs like, I don't know, 10, 15 bucks or something yeah. for an hour yeah. and a half. I, I see you do a lot of yoga, other stuff. What are you doing? I mean, you, you don't, do you still train or you, you, just, you just train other people? You know, you do. it's like... Going to the gym and training is very limited for me because I had this bicep tricep injury on the left side. And then I damaged my shoulder, my rotor cuff, uh, wrestling with a friend of mine and tore the supraspinatus. Had a couple of surgeries on there. And it, in the end, the tendon was just too short. It wouldn't take. So basically, I have no supraspinatus there, which makes that shoulder very weak. Mm -hmm. So doing any kind of upper body stuff, it's kind of frustrating and I have to go really light. Legs, I could bang away all day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, but then, you know, I was getting a bit tight around my back, around the hips and everything. And somebody suggested yoga and I did it. And I just, it, it was a challenge because I was terrible at it. I had no balance. My flexibility was okay because I always did some stretching. But my uh, ability to rotate, um, move, you know, I was like a, everyone that does weights, we're just moving in one plane all the time. So it was something I could work on and something I could improve where, you know, bodybuilding, I already been to as high as I could go and now I can't do it because I'm injured. And I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the challenge of doing that. I enjoyed the, like the tranquility and concentrating on the breathing. And it's totally opposite to what I did in the gym because in the gym, it's all push and it's all aggression and uh this is like if you do that in yoga you just fall over so um sorry i'm trying to turn off this phone that's okay so it was a challenge and i really enjoyed it it's uh, it a great feeling you have when you do yoga with the stretching and the movement and the breathing and i'm fortunate that i can do it outside in spain a lot of the time so i do yoga i do biking uh i've been doing a bit of pilates as well which is kind of similar to yoga um, more functional movements to try to like keep my body in a shape um, <clears throat> that
that's functional that I can do things as I get older because the wear and tear and right. stuff from the gym is there. You know, it's, my back's not bad. I got a little wear on the L5 because I stopped squatting uh, quite early on in my career. If I'd done continue with squats, I think my back would probably be in worse shape. So okay. fortunately, that's good. But both shoulders are damaged. Um, I came off my bike three months ago, dislocated my right shoulder and tore tendons there, which were probably already like yourself. You know, when they looked at your tendons, they're like, these things are already yeah. <laughs> torn up from all those years of heavy training. But mm-hmm. you don't really, you know, I may have a little pain here and there, but you don't re- you're not really conscious about it. So falling off the bike, finished that off. And um, they did want to do surgery, but, uh, you know, like I said, I had a couple of surgeries on the left shoulder and it didn't really rectify it. And I, I didn't want to take all the time off. So I've been doing a lot of uh, rehab stuff to strengthen the, the, the rotor cuff and everything in the gym. So it's not real heavy training. Um, I, you know, I, I remember seeing Jay Cutler doing Pilates. And at the time, I still had this gung ho bodybuilding mentality. What the fuck is doing Pilates? <laughs> you know? And now, now I'm doing it. So sorry, Jay, for thinking that. You know, it's, uh, me, me, you was know, he was maybe he combining some of this functional stuff? Yeah. Was he really doing movement. it though? Yeah. Was he really doing it, or was it just for for a photo? I don't know, man. I saw him doing some on the Pilates table and stuff. So I guess he was doing it to, you know, to avoid injuries and to keep mobile and everything, which was a smart thing to do. Um, so Pilates is great to try if you want to keep your flexibility and avoid injuries and stuff. Keep. Uh, I would yeah. have to get But flexible sure. first. Sorry. I said to keep the flexibility. I would have to get flexible first. What do you suggest me to do? I want to lose weight. I've been trying for 10 years to bring my weight down to around 220. I, I, I can't do it. Well, I, I, my weight was about 250 when I kind of changed uh, my diet. I went, I'm like, I've been eating a ton of protein for all these years and doing the same thing. I'm going to change my diet. Excuse me a minute, Dennis. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, be quiet. I got this little puppy and it's still not... <laughs> It's still gotta, not properly You still got to keep it in the cage? No, I don't know. I have him in the cage, but I'm trying to, you know, he wants to go and say hello to a gal inside. So I'm gonna <laughs> let him go. Come on. All right. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, so, yeah, I was about 250. My blood pressure was a little bit high. And I said, like, okay, I'm going to change things. Instead of having a ton of protein, I'm going to go to a plant-based diet. I'm not going to worry about protein. I'm going to have like, and I wasn't even counting it, but probably like 80 grams of protein a day max. Mm-hmm. And I lost weight, but I lost muscle as well because I wasn't training. I wasn't taking a ton of protein in. Um, but I didn't really care because I was doing something else mm-hmm. that like yoga and stuff and riding a bike where having a little bit less body weight was advantageous. And I think as you get older, it's not really great to carry all that weight. Even exactly. Like Really muscle. Exactly. Um, so that did it for me. I dropped from like 250 down to about 225 over three or four years, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and now I just modified my diet a bit more since I got injured with the bike. I felt I needed to bring a bit more protein uh, back into the diet for the repair process. So right. I started eating a bit more eggs and, and chicken breast and things like that. But, so, uh, so is your body weight going up doing that? Sorry? Does your body weight go up doing that? It's funny that I'm not even, because I must have been protein deficient, I think I was catabolic, I was losing muscle. Mm-hmm. And though, even though I'm not training, I'm not going to the gym, I just changed my diet and I put on like uh, seven or eight pounds in about three weeks and lean muscle. Yeah, It's like the body has that memory. As soon you're, as I hit the yeah. protein, it just, boom, it went up. And you're like me. It's like, you're wow, like me. people are like, man, you're looking in good shape. Is the training going well? I'm like, believe it or not, I'm not even training. I'm mm-hmm. just get more muscular by eating more protein because I, I was probably protein starved at that point. You're like me. I, I'm trying, you know, I, I've been doing two hours of Stairmaster every day. And I, uh, and I never did a lot of cardio. I mean, I do biking outside. Uh, and then I, cardio in the gym, I just do intervals. So I do like one minute easy, uh-huh. 20 second all out craziness. But I only do like 10 or 12 minutes a couple yeah. of times a week. Just I'm, just, I'm, just trying, I'm just trying everything just to lose weight. You know, and I cut my meals down. I have three meals a day and I have like a hundred grams of chicken per meal, which is like 25, right. 25 grams of protein. And, th- and that's all I eat. And my weight will not 
go down less than 238. You know, a lot of people are getting pissed off right now hearing this. <laughs> I, this guy's I, complaining I, he can't lose weight and we want to put weight on. But but uh, it's, it's true, though. I, I literally think, what, what am I supposed to do? What am well, I supposed to do? I mean, my experience of just going on a plant-based diet where I was just eating a lot of uh, vegetables and fruits and... Uh, I don't know, man. You know, I don't know if I can do it. And stuff like that. Uh, you know, I did it slowly. I didn't do it from one day to the next. Okay. I did like you're doing, like cutting down on the chicken slowly and bringing in more. Uh, and I felt great uh, on that for a while. But just, you know, my instinct told me and a couple of people that helped me out with the injury, a couple of uh, therapists said, man, you need to get back on some animal protein and get, you know, to help the tendons repair and everything. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And it was interesting that, wow, what a... What a difference in a few weeks. I just put on muscle without even touching the weight. Right. That's, that's so, awesome. I mean, if you really want to lose, I mean, you're not fat. You're, you're carrying a lot of muscle. Yeah, now. I'm not fat. So, I'm not fat. If you phase down your protein and you go to plant base, you'll probably lose, you'll probably lose more or, or stop lifting weight. <laughs> you know, that's what I did as well. I was at the you, same time doing something else, you know, doing yoga, doing Pilates, doing cardio. I wasn't lifting weights. There was not really a choice. It was more like because of the injuries. Maybe I should give that a try. Maybe I should just stick to the cardio and just stop training with weights. I train five days yeah, a week, but, but I, like I it, it, can you do that though? Because it's like you're used to doing that. It's almost like an addiction to go but, in. And but my train, my so I, I miss it because yeah. I can't do it. My training now is, I, I swear, I go in, I get a little pump, I leave. I I don't yeah. count sets. I don't count anything. I just go in when I feel I'm not sweating. I'm not going okay. into any pain mode. I'm not going to no burning yeah. sensations. I'm just literally just doing a little <clears throat> workout. That's it. I'm just literally, I, my workout is like 30 minutes. Yeah. Couple That's to it. three times a week or something? No, I, I go from Monday to Friday. I try. Okay. I try. Okay. You know, but, yeah. but th that's all I do. That's all I do. Yeah, but if you if you didn't do that for a couple of months, you start losing muscle. I know, but I don't want, to, I don't want my ass to start sagging. That's what I'm worried about. I got a big ass. <laughs> my ass to start sagging because everything will shrink down. My ass would stay big. I know it. That's why I'm doing the cardio. Well, I, I don't. I mean, the glutes are important. I had to start training mine. Yeah. Uh, See? Because my quads were really still really strong, but I was losing the glutes because I was just doing leg press and yeah, the leg extensions and biking and stuff like that. So I'm doing some glute specific stuff now because it's very important uh, to support your lower back and everything. A lot of people get back problems and hip problems is because their glutes are not firing properly and they're not okay. strong enough. So See, I, I, I don't even train, of, I don't even train legs. I stopped training legs a long time ago. Yeah. I just do the Stairmaster. I think I consider that my leg workout. Yeah, well, you're going to get some level of stimulation like me riding the bikes up the mountains are still, mm. you know, my legs are still muscular. Okay, I've lost size on them. And calves, I haven't trained since. Well, you don't need to train oh, your calves. Come on, man. Since 97, there's no <laughs> point, right? No. <laughs> Those are the it's, biggest it's calves. pretty good. People are still like, hey, you still got the calves, man. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I don't think they're going to ever go away. I don't they're think so. They've gone down either. a little bit, but they're still noticeable, you know? <laughs> so, that's, that's genetics, man. I started with the calves. The calves were bigger than my arms when I started, and that's, you know, it's gone back that way. Have you ever, have you ever focused on calves? Never. I always train them, but I train them like a couple of sets. Uh, I did them after quads, after hamstrings, so that at the end of the workout, and there was no like great, you know, mental uh, focus going into them. But I trained them really hard and really heavy, but just for a few sets. I mean, we, we had a calf raise in my gym. There was a thousand pounds. The standing calf raise, I remember. Standing calf raise, a thousand pound stack. And then we had. The bars on the side oh. where I ended up putting up like another 500 pounds. So I was doing 10 or 12 reps with 1,500 pounds and similar super heavy weights on a seated calf raise. But that's all I did once a week. Two sets of standing, two sets of seated. Once a week, that's it. That's it. Do you still follow bodybuilding now? Like follow bodybuilding where you see what's going on? I don't on? follow, follow, but I, you know, I know like the Olympia, I'll, I'll, I'll did you, uh, did you follow I'll the Olympia? I know who's placing where and so on. And uh, did you watch the Olympia? You played the last Olympia? I didn't watch it. I just saw the pictures. I didn't watch the live thing or anything like that. So, so it's hard for me to give a real. Yeah. So you uh, so you didn't so you didn't see any any footage at all? No, I didn't. So it's hard for me to give. Yeah. I saw pictures. Yeah. What do you think? Is, yeah. I, I just wanted to ask you about Phil. 
What do you think about well, Phil? Well, from the pictures, Phil was not his best. Yes. Somehow he looked kind of flat and a little bit smaller than it wasn't his usual uh, self. So, I mean, people were asking me before the contest. I'm like, it's kind of boring because Phil's going to win. Yeah, exactly. And I just assumed that he would win right. if, if he was at his best, but he wasn't at his best. Uh, maybe the time off or something like that. I, I don't know. Uh, what affected him? I haven't spoken to him about it, but he looked kind of like something was missing, like he was flat or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's the best way I can describe it. <clears throat> Maybe because of all the criticism he had about his belly, he was trying something different or trying to come in a bit flatter and less. I think he's, or, he's trying to come in too hard and, and he flattened out. That's what it yeah. looked like to me because he wasn't as hard as he usually is because he wasn't full. You could see there was some fullness oh, maybe, missing. Maybe he lost muscle and then, yeah. you know, you can lose size and look a bit softer as well as uh, and i think phil works with a coach so uh, had uh, not um, honey 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 sorry he works with honey so i don't know i haven't spoken to either of them so i don't really know what's going on there and i don't know if phil is coming back this year do you know i i, I doubt it he has nothing to prove anymore and yeah. uh, and and i i don't i i doubt it i don't, I don't see him because uh, he's 41 years old now. I mean, it's not like he's in his early 30s or his late 20s. Yeah. And uh, he's been chasing the 2011 and 2013 package for seven years. So yeah. what are the chances of him looking like he did in 2013? Because he would look, he would need to look like this and look like yeah, 2013. Yeah, I mean, one loss is not really going to damage his legacy. But if he kept coming back and losing, then... right. Uh, yeah, I know. I the last I yeah, I was talking to him, I was texting with him. The last thing is he's still filming on his on his documentary that he's doing with uh, the Rock's uh, film crew. Okay. And uh, he's still this is still not finished yet, so he's still filming. So, but he's not. Uh, I, I I doubt it. I I don't think he has anything to prove. And the worst thing, the last thing you want to do is come back and, and, and place even lower than than third because that that would maybe oh, hurt uh, what happened to this contest i was hearing uh, rumors about the rock was going to put on something yeah like they, the they they called the athletic con it was supposed to happen last year it was canceled because of corona this year was supposed yeah. to happen again in october it was canceled because of corona and now it is postponed to uh i think april 22. Okay. It's supposed to be a huge event, like with huge expo, and, and, and you can imagine, I mean, everybody wants to jump on board with him. Yeah, when I'm it sure comes... that they can pull that together. Yeah. And, um, but they so got to gotta have the crowd. If the Olymp is on and we can travel, then I'll be over yeah. this year. There's only a couple of Olympias that I missed, and, you know, last year being one right. of them, obviously. Right. So now, there's, uh, are you going to the, uh, to the Arnold in England? Yeah. Uh, we already... Um, booked space there and everything. So I'm going to be there with my company in October again. I mean, things are so uncertain. You, you can't say for hundred percent that it will happen. I was just going to ask you, England's is it going always, to happen? You know, the England's always changing things and uh, <clears throat> gyms are supposed to open April the 12th and hopefully they do. And then things remain more open, but uh, you never know. And, Interestingly, the Arnold is in Birmingham, so it's in my hometown. It's your hometown, so yeah. Well, you got to have yeah. a booth if it's happening. You got to be there. Yeah, I mean, we're, I'm, I'm there. We already uh, uh, arranged everything with the promoters and got the space and everything. So hopefully that goes ahead, and uh, I look forward to being there and meeting everybody. You know. All right, awesome, brother. I can't thank you enough, man, for making time, man, to come on. Wow. This I really appreciate it. Um, I wish you continued success, my brother. Do what you do what you do best, man. That's training people in the gym. Stay healthy, my friend. And I'm looking forward to get together, man. If I can't make it to my bay, hopefully you can make it to the U.S. Because they won't let One me. One way or another, man. One yeah. way or another. Uh, It'll be nice to catch up again. Yeah, for sure, man. For sure, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Give right, Gail my love. And uh, take care, my friend. Be safe.